afternoon and welcome to this month's diversity, equity, and inclusion presentation. I'm Rashida McMurray Abdullah, and in honor of International Women's Day, it is my pleasure to introduce celebrated textile and fiber artist Lisa Butler as our special guest. We have an hour today to really talk about and celebrate women's accomplishments, and particularly at International Women's Day, it's designated as a global celebration of the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women, I thought it would be best to celebrate with an artist that is known for capturing the moment. International Women's Day is also a time for reflection for how far women have come, advocacy for what is still needed, and action to continue to break down glass ceilings. With over a century of history, International Women's Day is a growing movement centered around unity and strength. This day has a very rich history. The first glimpse of it was in 1909 with the protests of 50,000 women who wanted to, who were protesting long work hours and a lack of voting rights in New York City. It was originally called National Women's Day and the, mon the monumental annual celebration spread throughout the world. In 1913, International Women's Day was designated as official holiday in Russia, but Russian women continue to face oppression. Similarly, in the United States, on March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration, thousands of women's women marched along Pennsylvania Avenue, the same right as the inaugural parade. In that same march, the founding members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated were asked to march in the back of the parade less than two months after their incorporation. In 1977, the United Nations celebrated the, the day for the first time and it continues to gain momentum annually. This year's theme is women in leadership, achieving an, e an equal future in a COVID-19 world. This past crisis over the past year has highlighted, and central, has highlighted some of the central issues about women's contributions to the decisions, policies, and laws, and the recognition that women in all of their diversity must be integrated into our new normal. The power of storytelling and capturing history is often an artistic medium. And we always have different artists who capture the moment at different times in our history. Today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about Visa. I'm going to probably read her background so that I don't miss anything. Visa is known for her quilted portraits celebrating black life and cultural identity. Her work is currently the focus of a solo exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago. Her works are also included in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, Minneapolis Institute of Art, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, the Newark Museum of Art, the Toledo Museum of Art, and Orlando Muse Museum of Art, just among others. In addition, Visa was recently awarded a United States Artist Fellowship. She has created two covers for Time Magazine, one of which was a quilt quilted portrait of Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Wangri Mathai, who was featured on an issue honoring the 100 women of the year in 2020. Her second Time Magazine cover depicted Portia Bennett Bay as Guardian of the Year in 2021. Bisa was born and raised in South Orange, New Jersey. She graduated cum laude from Howard University with a bachelor's in fine arts, and then went on to earn her master's degree from Montclair State. Please join me in welcoming Bisa to Wiley. Welcome, Bisa. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful reading of my uh, last and most recent accomplishments. Um, so please, uh, so sure, please sure. Can, oh, the next 45 minutes, we're just gonna have a discussion about some of your works. And I'm so grateful that you were, you were able to share some of those pieces with you. So do you wanna just go ahead and get started or anything other remarks that you have before we kick off? Yeah, um, let's go ahead and get started. And I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm so excited to be speaking to my friend of how many years now? Over 20 years. <clears throat> and excited to share my work with you. I chose this piece so that you all could see what my work looked like up close. And a lot of times people are sort of wondering, what is it that I'm doing? Yes, I am a quilter. But the way I use quilts is different than what you most likely thought in your mind when you said, you know, Bisa Butler is a quilt artist. You think of geometric squares 
And you also think of something that you can use on your bed. Uh, my quilts are more wall hanging and I focus on portraits of the African-American community. And what you're seeing in front of you is a detail of a bigger piece that we'll see further into the slides where it's a family of seven. But this is one of the family members, one of the sisters, and every bit of artwork that I'm doing is fabric. Her face, all the different colors that you're seeing, the pinks and the oranges, the reds, those are bits of silk and cotton. Her eyes are made out of velvet and cotton. Even her hair, you'll see that they are blue flowers. So those are like a polyester, sort of like a, a rayon polyester blend of flowers that I cut out of a piece of lace and then used to give this idea of African-American textured hair. I love celebrating Black features, Black hair texture, and then also referring, um, giving a reference to something else. So you see her hair, you get the idea that it's puffy or it has some dimension, but then it's also because it's fabric and we all have closets full of fabric, we're wearing fabric constantly, we can relate to those blue flowers, giving us the idea of delicacy. And now these are things that I did while I was a student in undergrad at Howard University. Um, I studied with um, the Dean of the School of Fine Arts at the time, Jeff Donaldson, founded this group of artists in the 60s called Afrocobra. And Afrocobra stood for the African Commune of Bad and Relevant Artists. So he did that when he was in his early 20s in Chicago on the South Side. Then Jeff Donaldson um, becomes, um, gets appointed the Dean of Fine Arts at Howard University. And like the Dean, you said you can help set the tone of the school. And you also are pulling in other artists who you know to be professors and people who are in academia. So the painting faculty were primarily members of Afrocobra. And you're seeing some of the tenants of Afrocobra when you look at this work here. So this was my very, very first ever like fabric anything. And this was my professor, um, Al Smith at Howard telling me, um, well, I actually went to him and said like, I'm struggling. I don't feel like my paintings stand out. I don't feel like every artist out here, even artists that you see in galleries and exams or even artists on the street, they're looking for their own voice. You know, um, if you think about artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, they're always finding paintings from antiquity that look just like theirs and they had to go through this whole thing trying to authenticate it. And that's because they they could teach artists to paint like them. But the problem was those other artists didn't have their own voice. So you could paint like da Vinci, you could completely knock it off, but you don't have your own identity. What is it that you're saying that's as individual, that's as an individual? So this piece here was my very first foray into like Al Smith telling me, use your own personality in your artwork. You like fabric, you like clothes. So why don't you cut up some of, um, get fabric and define the face using fabric itself. Look at the art of Vermeer Biernan. Um, look at the collages and see what they did. A lot of times in my earlier works, I was portraying my family members. So the piece you're seeing on the screen is my father's father, my grandfather. But I didn't have any photos of my grandfather. Um, my father was born and raised in Ghana. So I needed a photo of an African man, a Ghanaian man, and specifically from Northern Ghana, where my father is from. Um, without any photos and my father not really being able to supply too much information about what his father looked like. He died in around 1950 of an appendicitis, just a random thing that can happen when you live in a country and you live in an area where you don't have necessarily have a lot of money and a lot of access to good health care. My grandfather had appendicitis. He passed away within a number of couple of days and so I've always had that idea that loss. What did he look like? What was my grandfather like? What did he sound like? Did he laugh? Was he funny? Was he stern? I have none of that. And I found an image of a, an older African man from Northern Ghana. This was a photo of a man 
who, who, who helped build the Volta Dam, which was a famous project in Ghana at the time of Kwame Nkrumah. And I decided, let me make a portrait of this grandfather using pieces of my father's dashikis. So the image on the left-hand side was the first one that I did while I was in class. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to go to grad school. I was getting my master's in art education at Montclair State and my professor, well, the good thing at Montclair State, they had their own requirements for getting this degree. Everybody had to take jewelry making and fiber arts, which we didn't have at Howard. So what you're seeing here is my first quilted artwork. The piece I did at Howard was a collage. It was cut out and glued. But the piece on the left, you can see like I'm actually stitching because that class, fiber arts, they had us do quilts, knitting, weaving. Um, we did some surface design, we did felting. And the quilt, it just had to be small and it wasn't elaborate, that, but they said we could do a landscape, we could do a still life or a portrait. So this image, this portrait, I used my father's fabrics, his old dashikis, because I couldn't afford to go out and just buy a whole bunch of African fabric. That was out of the out of the question for me. At the time, I was a wife and a mother of two, and I was not working. I was in school and didn't have a lot of money. But by using those dashikis, I was using my father's actual clothing, the things that he lived and wore in Africa before he came here and while he was a young student. So I'm using his experiences and, and um, actually his actual DNA, you know, when you wear something, if you ask any uh, CSI investigator, you know, there's bits of DNA on that in order to create this imagined portrait of the grandfather that I never knew. And on the right hand side, I did that image again um, a year later. So you can see that I was learning how to translate with fabric the planes of a face, learning how to express an actual ex um, facial expression by just using fabric and um, different types of fabric. And this was another piece that I did around that same time I was in college. My father's from Ghana. My mother was born in New Orleans and raised with, um, with was raised in Morocco. So anyway, that, that's a, a whole nother story, but I wanted to show my mother's parents. My, grand, my grandmother, I did know. My grandfather, I knew him shortly, but he passed soon after I um, was born. Actually, not soon after I was born, but I was a small child. But I brought this one up and I wanted to show you all because this was the first like um, double portrait that I had done. Um, I made this piece for my grandmother when she was, uh, her health was failing and I really wanted to make something special for her. I actually painted her, uh, she sat for me and I painted her and she absolutely hated that painting. I always tell that story, but it is true. She told me that I made her look really old and I had to like sort of check my own like art idea and realize who wants a portrait of themselves as their health is failing anyway. And I started looking for photos and I realized that she had her wedding photo on her dresser my whole life. So I decided, let me make that in fabric. And so the piece on the right, you'll see, my grandmother's name was Violet, by the way. So I used that bluish violet fabric in order to communicate her name. So this is something that I made. Now we're jumping from grad school into almost 10 years later, me as an art teacher, mother, um, and I was working at Columbia High School and I got signed with a an art gallery, the Claire Oliver Gallery, which I still am with to this day. So this I did this piece about four about four years ago. And this is another one of my childhood friends, um, a woman. She is a mother, wife, she's a nurse, a mother of four. Uh, I think she's a brand new grandmother. Um, and this is her photo of her last her last school photo in Jamaica. And this represents, I chose this piece because it represents me shifting my career from primarily doing images of family and friends. Although yes, this is still a very close 
friend of mine, but I was preparing to exhibit at Miami Art Basel with the Claire Oliver Gallery. And I wanted to have like a, a selection of work. I was gonna go to Miami, this huge international art fair for the first time. Um, they are, I think at any one fair, they have like 150 booths. And within those 150 booths, you might have one to five artists exhibiting at each booth, galleries from all over the world, Africa, Asia, Europe, United States, so this was like the big time for me. And for most artists, you really get introduced to the world stage all at once in this one weekend. So this piece, I wanted it to go back to what I liked and what I was interested at the time I was working with children. So you're going to see like more images of children. Um, you, if you can recall those Afro Cobra colors with the continent, colors of the African continent colors of Kool-Aid. So even though her clothing is African and has these bright, intense colors, her skin is also now reflecting those same bright, intense colors. So this is the famous photo I was taken in 1940. Um, must be 41, I always forget that, but it's on the license plate if you look closely. It was by Russell Lee. He was one of the photographers of the Farm Securities Administration. This photo was called Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday on the south side of Chicago. That's when it was taken and that this is what's happening. This is why these boys are dressed to the nines. They have their hats. They have their, um, not spats, but they have one little boy has his knickers on. They're wearing double breasted coats. I mean, this is how I love this photo because it represents how we want to be seen. These are the images that I remember from childhood on Easter morning, how important it was to look good and to, to look our best. And this photo, there's one thing about it that bothers me and only that the young man in the center, his name was Spencer Reedus. He's the only one who's ever been identified Spencer Reedus did not see this photo until he was in the dentist's office as an elderly man towards the end of his life. His son took him to the dentist. He opens up a Life magazine and boom, there's his photo of himself that he never even knew existed. When Spencer Reedus saw the photo, he ripped it out of the Life magazine, folded it, put it in his pocket and didn't say anything about it. So think about how he felt seeing that photo there. And so this is my quilt of that image that I called Southside Sunday Morning. And I really wanted to explore their clothing more. Each boy's individual features, you know, who's the leader of the group, who is bored with the whole thing and ready to move on as children do, who's dapper, who's shy. I love showing that individuality of children. When I made this, I was still a classroom teacher working with Black, White, um, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Asian. I had students of all races, but their individuality was very important. In order to be a successful teacher, you have to recognize that each kid is very, very different. They're all valid. Um, they all have something to add and they all deserve that respect. And the problem that we are having in this country now and have been having and when I was making this piece as well, was around the time when Trayvon Martin was um, beaten and killed for walking in the neighborhood because he, I guess he had on a hoodie or because he was a black young man and he didn't identify himself appropriately to a random stranger vigilante. And I, I still struggle with that. These young men are beautiful all on their own just being children. And so I'm always trying to push that idea in my artwork, acknowledge their humanity. I love, what I love about your art is I love the storytelling and you know being able to see it up on your wall and just taking a pause when you need, particularly in this time when we're not together, it makes yeah. you feel like you're together because you have yeah. the, the colors. And when you see the colors, you can't do anything but smile. So, <laughs> right. so, so now that we've gotten close to the end, 
Um, what are some of the things that you just want to leave with our audience today about your artwork and your journey? Um, I really feel like it's amazing that just being able, to, I think the one thing that resonated with me before you started is when you shared, when you went to the Art Institute of Chicago, how excited when you started to talk about your journey and there was crickets and you're like, okay, what happened? And then they were like, we've never talked to an artist that's alive to talk about their work and how amazing that is. <laughs> um, so I really kind of like the end of conversation on that note. Sure. I mean, it, it's been an amazing experience. I mean, where my artwork is at the Art Institute is the European Painting Galleries, where they had um, an El Greco exhibit. El Greco, he painted and lived in the 1500s. So they have had plenty of African-American artists exhibit at the Art Institute before. So I'm not saying that, but the galleries where mine is up the grand staircase, they have never had a living artist exhibit in that space. They've never had a black person exhibit in that space. They've never had a woman exhibit in that space. They've never had quilts exhibit in that space. So it's been like mind blowing, amazing. The fact that they took El Greco's down and put mine up was just like symbolic in a way that I couldn't quite get a grip on. Um, the Chicago Tribune had an article mentioning it said the shows that are up in Chicago right now uh, Monet, uh, Van Gogh, and Bisa Butler. Like that was the title. So that was pretty amazing. Um, I just feel grateful to be in this space and all of us who are in here, I just wanna acknowledge that we all have the skills that we need to be our authentic selves. My skill of sewing my grandmother and my mother taught me before I have ever even went to school. And I think it's important for us to reflect back on the lessons that our own ancestors and elders who could still be living left for us and are leaving for us and to not discount that as something that we need to help us survive in the future. Most times when when you talk, look at a society and you know our architecture major. So a lot of times it is about what a, a society builds or celebrates within art and structure is the legacy that it has. And particularly what we do as lawyers, it's so important because we are out there creating, you know, justice and advocating for our clients in many different ways. And so having a little bit of inspiration and understanding even the work ethic and the design and perspective on the artist. I think it's also very helpful for how we think about and approach our problems and, and it being attuned to being very diverse. Um, so maybe one day when uh, there'll be that, you know, now everybody's a famous artist because they can do the sit and see. <laughs> maybe there'll be a time when we could do fabric and see and see. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. 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 So um, there's a loud applause. You said you just can't hear it because we're in a virtual setting. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your time and your candor and just sharing. Um, it was wonderful having the opportunity to speak with you again three decades later. Um, yeah. I'm really very honored to, to, to bring you to share you, your story with the YB team. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Loved hanging out with you. Yeah, sending you virtual hugs. Likewise. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we will do somewhat of a recording after we make sure that it, it comparts with Lisa in case there's anybody in your group that might have missed it. Um, thank you again. Happy International Women's Day. And look forward to our next segment. Take care. <laughs>